So I just took a bit about myself before we start the course. So my name is Promise AK. I have a bachelor's in geology from Federal University of Petroleum Resources. And I've worked as a geoscientist with GigiConnect. And I went to Imperial College to study petroleum geosciences. That was in 2020. And currently I'm a data geoscientist with CGG. Yeah, so I'm applying data sciences and my science skills to help solve um, subsurface problem and transform data. Yeah, I have other interests. I love chess. Back then in school, I won um, a few medals in chess with my school team. I love travels. I've not really done a lot of that in recent time because of the pandemic, and we are all trying to adjust to the post-pandemic um, life. Yeah, I enjoy teaching, like I said initially, and I, because of my love for teaching and trying to communicate, I signed out a YouTube channel to help professionals, to help people learn those data science skills. And if you're interested in things like that, you could just sign up or subscribe to the channel so that you get up-to-date information and just learn. Because I'm, I signed out as a roadmap, I call it a roadmap to become a data scientist. So we're taking you step-by-step step on all the processes you need, all the steps you need and things you need to learn to become a data scientist, yeah. And I will just hand over to Imo to just give us, Imole, his name is Imole Ayo, to give us a brief intro about himself. All right, so my name is Imole Ayo and uh, I'm a data geoscientist with CGG, I'm from Nigeria. Right and then um, my passion is love for life and geoscience. I live my passion and my passion is my energy. Basically it's what guides me on through. And I'll just talk briefly on my career path studies. So I had my education bachelor's in the Federal University of Technology at Korea and had two major internships then, one with Danvik and the other with ExxonMobil. Uh, thereafter, proceeded to take in um, in Poland. Just before then, had um, my geoscience intern, also a training program after my graduation. And thereafter, I went on to Poland, first starting out at the University of Silesia and then AGH University, where I took um, Polish language studies and geophysics course, and also had the opportunity to intern in um, a geoscience research company there as a geophysics intern. So there on, I had moved to France for my MSc, where I then completed my master's, which was uh, sponsored by Equino, and yeah, Long story cut short, I'm now with uh, CGG working as a data geoscientist. By data visualization, we are telling the course Python for data visualization. So we want to know why are we even doing um, data visualization? One, the world is everything, the world is changing. And one of those the major change is tailored around technology. And data is one of like the trending technology. And data, it's the value of data is in, um, increasing everything is um on the rise and a lot of people will tell you that data is the new oil so you have to get familiar position yourself for what's coming and like i said data has been generated every day like the like you click on social media is data when you put in your information or type in something or visit the website these are all data and with this continuous generation of data you have a large amount of data available so and most of these data are in either structured or unstructured form. And when you just look at data, most of the time you may not be able to see anything. Just imagine seeing like an Excel sheet with different things inside. You may not really understand what is in that Excel sheet, but it's also a, with data visualization, you kind of start bringing out pictures from the data that could exist in different form. So that's why data visualization is very important. If you can have a large amount of data that is valuable, but if you're not able to bring out any meaningful thing from the data, if the data is as good as useless. It's like having a money and you're stored up somewhere that you cannot use. What's the essence of having the money? So it's for you to be able to use for day-to-day -day life. So with data visualization, data visualization is a key to, to bring out value from the data. So with data visualization, data analysis, you are able to bring out, pick out trends and patterns in your data and make them, to tell your picture says a thousand words, rather than maybe trying to explain this is this. When you show someone a picture, 
you are able to communicate enough information that you may not be able to say with your mouth. So that's one of the essence of um, data visualization. Also, data visualization helps you to identify patterns. By the time you start creating, by the time we go deep into what we're doing today, you'll see how we could use data visualization to tell a story. So when you have a data you have issue, you can tell the story of this is what's happening in data, this is what, what has happened, this is what's happening, and try you'll be able to communicate the valuable information within your data. Also, data, uh, everything is still kind of captured in whatever I've said, enables, um, it's a tool to enable people to understand complex data. Because there are some data that no matter how hard you try to look at, if you're not seeing it in a picture form, it gets complex and confusing. Even in complex things with um, chat, with visualization, you could make those seemingly complex things or difficult things understandable, right? So I want to go to about data when I talk about programming, data visualization, irrespective of the field you are, you can apply this. So it's like a basic principle. In the registration form, you see, you saw like when you put your, your discipline. And one interesting thing we saw from that um, data, because it's also data, is that we have lots of people signed up for this course, people from the finance um, industry, we have people from geosciences, people from banking sector, People from different um, fields, you could, so this data visualization can be applicable to different people, different industry, just learn the basics and you can apply it to whatever you want to do, basically. Then um, I expect at the end of this course, what you should know or what you should be leaving this course with, at least you have an um, understanding of what programming language is and the benefits of Python. And you should know at least to a reasonable extent Python for data visualization, know how to carry out basic um, Python visualization using Python. You should you will also know how to clean, how to prepare your data, transform and manipulate your data. Because most times when they when you get data, they are, you could say they are dirty in a dirty form. So you should be able to clean because for you to carry out meaningful data, meaningful analysis from your data, you should work with clean data. So your model or your visualization is as good as um, your visualization is as good as the data you have to visualize. So at the end of the day, you should know how to prepare your data. You should know about the different visualization techniques, different plots you could use to tell your story. So you, uh, we also tell you about the different tools you can use for data visualization. You learn some practical, best, best practice, because I always say there are good ways and there are bad ways to do things. So it's good to know the good ways and the best ways because sometimes you might want to cut corners and go around there. And also at the end, you also know we have um, some practical applications. So we have um, real life data and carry out some practical applications on it. Then how do you get the most from this course? First of all, you have to be open-minded. Like open-minded, I think this is the key. You have to be open-minded because most of the time people come with, ah, programming is difficult and they just it just makes them shrink. And at that time, if you have that mind that programming is difficult, no matter what I say, it wouldn't make sense to you. So come with that open-mindedness and okay, anything is possible, yeah? Then ask questions, like there's nothing like a stupid question. So if you're having a challenge or doing something, bet you there are lots of people that have similar um, question to ask, just that you are the only person that, that is confident enough or courageous enough to ask that question. So no matter how seemingly stupid the question is, please ask. If you don't ask, you cannot, um, you won't know. Yeah. Listen and take notes, like pay attention, maximum attention, try to cut away distractions. And because if you miss one thing, it, it, can, it can affect you for the length of the course because you'll be like steps behind. So try to listen and take note. And most importantly, practice and follow through. I think that's why they put up a poll earlier. How many people have been able to install the environment because we'll be working, like we'll be kind of practical coding. So you should be able to follow through because it sticks well better when you do it yourself rather than, okay, let me listen and I'll do it later. Trust me, that doesn't work. It will, it, like I've been there before, yeah? So now let's even just talk about talk, talking about programming. What is programming? I know a lot of people have heard programming, programming. Programming is just simply a way to give instructions to your computers because computers don't understand human languages. They don't understand English. They don't understand French, Yoruba, or Igbo. 
they work with um, zeros and one. And remember, I don't know if you remember your primary school when you handled binary, just imagine having to do with binary. So computer languages is in zero. So now in order for, because writing in binaries can be difficult, um, people came up with ways to kind of give instructions to your computer without writing, writing in binaries. That's what we call uh, programming or coding. So look, looking for ways to pass our information across to the computers without necessarily writing in binaries. Yeah? Like I said, okay, I talked about this. Okay, so these languages are in between the human and computer language. Some languages are closer to um, our human language. So there are different programming languages out there. So there are some that are closer to the machine learning languages. And yeah, so another thing again is programming language. I know you would have heard of different programming languages and people tell you this is better than this. In, in essence, no programming language is better than the other. It just depends on what do you want to. So if I, I want to do a particular task, there are some programming languages that would be better for that. For example, I want to build a website. I want to naturally link to HTML because that's what's good for that task. If you want to do, let's say, data sciences, maybe you want to link towards Python R. If I want to do maybe machine learning, I want to do Python. So in essence, there is no one that is better than the other. It just depends on what's your goal for taking for what for what, doing what you want to do i just came with them those um, chats where i talk about human language and computer languages yeah so human understands english at one end of the scale and computers understand binary right so they are like i was saying if you want to write binary imagine letter a this is the numbers you need to write you want to convert that to binary and like it doesn't make sense so the call, those um, languages, because I think that in this broad scale of um, programming languages, there are some that are closer to the computer one, and there are some that are closer to the human language. So that it's like more like India selling the computer English. So the ones closer to the human language is called high level language. And the ones closer to the machine language is called low level language. They are called low level languages. So an example of um, low level language would be machine code assembly language, like. I don't know, I think it was when I was doing research for this kind of um, presentation that I even came across this. To, in today's world, you don't really see a lot of low-level languages. It's to be more of just like computer engineers that do a lot of these low-level languages. But most of um, people programming, you want to talk about your Python, C++, Java, Scala, R, they are all, they are all high-level languages. So it's something that you can easily relate to and not abstract, yeah? So now I want to ask myself, why are we doing Python? So I talked about, um, I mentioned um, there are different purposes for different languages. So for if I want to say, if I want to do um, view the website, for example, I'll have to use HTML. So HTML is not a general purpose language. So there are some languages that can be used for different things, right? And there are some that are used for specific things. So Python is one of those general language that you can you could use Python to build websites, have some dependencies on other libraries. You could use Python for data analytics. If you, you could use um, Python for machine learning for different, so it's a general purpose language. So that's why I kind of push for people to learn Python, right? Then it's widely used, it's a widely used programming language. A lot of companies like big companies make use of um, Python to build their application. It's very, it's, um, user friendly and beginner friendly. So it's something that is easy to learn. So there are the syntax in Python is as like English language, like you're writing something in English language. So as we go along, you understand why I say it's, uh, it's syntax, it's a similar syntax to English language. It's a high level language, like I said initially, like in the previous slide, it's high level language. And it has extensive libraries for data visualization. You have Matplotlib, you have um, Sibon, you have Plotly dash, there are lots of libraries that you can use embedded within Python that some of all these other languages wouldn't have necessarily. Then it's very it's very popular and, and it has a wide um, support network. So for example, I'm trying to do something today and I get stuck, I just go online and, and definitely you see people that ask that question and you see a lot of people that answer that question. So whenever with Python, you're never stuck. 
there's always help out there's just so about asking you just go online and search know what you want to ask and ask it definitely you'll see your answer online so that's why it's very good because it's very popular a lot of people i think over 70 percent of programmers use python so many big companies use python for their applications for example is um for your um, youtube google is written in python talk about um, instagram dropbox all these are all done with python in it so if you are learning python today it's very valuable because you can apply it in different industries and in different companies okay now we'll talk about coding mindset before we start it's good to talk about your mindset like initially i talked about having an open mind right and one of those open mind deadness you should have is coding is not difficult yeah you should have that in your head that coding is not difficult it's a lifelong process you can't learn everything today no matter even if I spent 24 hours teaching this course, you can't learn everything today. So it's more like life as you, if you don't know everything, the more you grow, the more you learn. Same thing with Python, the more you use Python, the more you use advance in Python, the more you learn everything. So there's no way to learn everything. And another thing is people make mistakes. I want to learn everything. I want to know all the syntaxes. I want to know the libraries. It's like wanting to learn English language and going to open your dictionary to say, I must learn all the words today. No, and like I said, Python is a uh, general purpose language. So if I want to learn Python for data sciences or data visualization, there are some libraries I shouldn't concern myself with. So it depends on what you want to do. You tailor your learning to what you want to do. And even if you, okay, I want to do data visualization, I shouldn't all be focused on, I, could, I can't do everything. I can't learn everything at the same time. What I tell people mostly is know that most of the time we'll do this course, it's just, like, just because at, at some point it might get overwhelming, but even when it gets overwhelming, just tell yourself, it, I don't have to put everything in my head today. Just know that this can be done so that when I want to, when I face a problem, I can say, okay, I can start looking for how to do it. So rather than say, I must know how to do it, know that like, this can be done, this can be done. When you get to the point where you need it, you know how to ask for it it and you definitely even to, to, there are some things i still get to learn every day because i work with python so just know that okay anything can be done i don't know, I need to know everything let me just start with what i need to know at this point and as you progress you get more familiar with it and get to learn more things yeah another thing again be willing to try new things the worst case scenario is your your code won't run so you should just try it it won't kill anybody you won't shut down so whenever you have an idea try to implement your idea because that's how most uh, companies on bridge initiative starts just from an idea so you should be willing to try out whatever you think it's new even if it's never been done just like can i think about this thing can i do it yes and also your codes should be specific and easy to read rather than writing jargon so i think as we go along to now you understand what this means yeah your issue, your code should be written to solve a problem. So it should not be zigzag. So it should be well coordinated. You should master debugging. What's debugging? If debugging is maybe some you run a code and it's not working. You should be able to say, why is this not working? So it's something you should know. It will help you a lot. By the time you run something and know at least be able to trace where the problem is coming from and fix the problem. Another thing again with coding is do not repeat yourself. There's this I'm acronym dry. So if you see something that you need to be doing always. Look for how to automate it rather than doing it, repeating it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. So this is more like a schedule I planned out for today, but clearly we've overgone that. So we just we have some breaks in between, some stretch breaks and water breaks and try to, yeah. Yeah, follow through. So we'll be going into the live coding session. Um, so we're supposed to take uh, yeah, we need to take a break. We're having like a five minutes break. Then by the time we come back, we would be going into coding life. So you should have set up your environment. I believe a lot of it, Alex, a reasonable amount of people would have installed um, Anaconda on their laptop. So in, when we get back from the break, I'll show you how to launch. And to, for those people that don't have it, don't worry. We could also use Google Collab. I will also show you how to use Google Collab. Yeah, so that's it for now. Just take like stretch break. Take, get a bottle of water. If you need to get a note, take your notes and yeah, when we we'll get back, we'll start. Okay, so we'll start now.
So for those that have installed the um, Anaconda, if you just go on your, your search bar and type Anaconda Navigator. So just type on Anaconda Navigator. It takes a while for that to come through. Okay, so you see like a platform like this. So depends on what you like. You could use um VS Code, maybe something like that teach to show you VS Code. But for now, we're focusing on Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, so just click on your launch. So I don't know if you installed using the video that was sent earlier, you could change your environment. So whatever environment you want to use, so you could just change there. So on the video, if you watch the video, I talked about you um, launching your Jupyter using them, the command prompts. Yeah, but this is like more like an easy way. Sometimes it's good to learn how to type in code, but this is just more like click, click, click. You just come here, change your environment and launch your Jupyter notebook. It opens it up in a browser. Yeah. So you could just navigate to where you want to, um, where you want to save your, your, your notebook. So I could just um, create a folder. Let me just create a new folder. Okay. Before that, let's create a folder. Yeah, just create a folder and on the folder, just um, create a new Python 3. So you see Python 3 IPL panel. Just click on that to open up your Jupyter notebook. Okay, let me know if you're here or if you're struggling to get here. Then for the people without um, Anaconda installed on their computer, just go online and type Google Collab, Google Collab, Collab Python. So you see, you could just do yeah, Collab Python, then you can see Welcome to Collaboratory. So by the time you click on this, you could just close, you could just on bottom, maybe you see new notebook. So this saves to your Google Drive. If you are using Google Collab, and one thing, if you are using Google Collab, you always have to be online for you to work. But if you're using your Jupyter, you don't need to be online. It doesn't require internet. So just launch your Jupyter notebook. So you could you could just come here and change to whatever you want to call it. Because if Python training, I said day one, day one. Day one. The one, yeah, so that's for collab. So we're there. If you're struggling, please put it in the comment section because we need everybody to follow through. Deborah, where, where are you lost? Do you have it installed on your computer? If no, you're using Google Collab, just go online, type Google Collab. Okay, if you just go online, type Google Collab, Google Collab, Google Collab Python. Then when you click on this, I'm going, going through it again, Quick click on Welcome to Collaboratory. Then you see this pop-up. Even if you don't see this pop-up, for example, you just say, come here, just come to files and say new notebook. So with open notebook, if you already have a, a notebook open, maybe you're already working on something, you want to go back to what you're working on. But in this case, you just go to new, click on your new notebook and it's opened. Deborah, are you, are, are you follow through now? Okay. Okay, so now, so learning language is language. You have some things you need to know about the language. So I could just put, okay, learning a language. So before we even go, so it's what we call, if we come up here, you see what we call code and markdown. So code is where you write out your code. You want to code something and you want your computer to write it for you. Why markdown is if I want to write like a text. Because if, for example, if I write a text and it's if on, in a code block, it will return it as an error. But if I want to maybe write something and add in, I could say, okay, this adding is, let's say, Python visualization, Python training, training for data visualization. This is an adding or a heading, rather. And if you write it in a code block, it wouldn't work for you, right? So, but by the time you specify one, and she shows that different levels of headings. Where are you lost? Um, so you're using Anaconda. Where have you opened? Open up your Anaconda Navigator. Are you here already? If you're here, just click on launch. You get to where we are. Yes, just click on this and it opens up the Jupyter Notebook. 
in your browser, change to Markdown to write out data visual. So if, you, if I press Control or Command, so if you're using a Markdown, a MacBook, you could do Control, Enter, Command, Enter, or Shift, Enter. If you're using a Windows, just do Control, Enter. You see the difference. So let me show you the difference between Control and Command, Enter, and Shift, Enter. If I do Shift, Enter, it opens up a new line. It gives me a new line. But if I just do Control, Enter, it just runs that without getting a new line. So that's the difference. So you can use either way to, to kind of exit this, or you could just come run and that works. Yeah. So if I say, okay, let's put something learning a language. If I change this to Markdown, if you want to learn a language, learning a language, there are certain things you need to know about that language. If you want to learn a language, first of all, you want to know what are the terms, what are the common terms you use in the language. What are the terms in the language? Um, we talk about, okay, this is not what I want to do here. Yeah, terms in the language. We want to talk about what are the data types? Data types in the language, data types in the language. We also want to look at what are the actions? What are the actions in the language? It's more like, what? Are the, so the, the terms and data types are more like nouns if you're learning English language. Then the actions are more like verbs, action words. What are the doing words? So those are your actions. Then we'll talk about best practices. So there are best ways, there are good ways and bad ways to do things. So as we go along, I'll be telling you about some of the good ways to do things and how to do. Before we start, some of the terms we need to learn is um, variable. Variable, what are variables? Variables are more like seat as containers you use to store information. Variables are containers to store information. So you could just quickly let me think how far. So maybe if you have a notebook, just a pen or something, variables are used to store information. And if you want to create a variable, it's called variable declaration. So let's okay, I could just do something and just change this. So we are talking about terms, terms in a language language so the first thing is we're talking about um variable variable variables okay first of all what, what are variables variables are used to store information right and when you want to assign a variable you use the equals to sign it's called variable declaration so you declare your variable so if I want to declare a variable, for example, x, x, x equals to five, what have, I, what have I just done? I've declared a variable and I've assigned the number five to x so that whenever I call x, when I say print, print x, so print is a function you can use to print something. So I say print x, it returns it as five. So I've stored, so x, that variable, I've stored that um, um, x as five. So in any way in my notebook, if I call, X, it tells me that X is, is five. So I've declared that variable. Also, you can use um to declare a variable. You could be you could use letters to declare a variable. So I can say like I said, I've, I've typed in X. I could maybe use a name. I say name equals to something. So it has it has it could be one letter. It could be multi words. It could be one word. And there's something some ways to declare a variable is that. You don't start a variable with a number. For example, if I want to type, I want to say a variable five is equals to, this is wrong. Like we're also talking about the best ways and good ways to do things. You can just use a number to assign a variable that's wrong. But if I want to say, I can say, okay, but it could also contain number. I can say name one is equals to, I can say, okay, my name promise. Yeah. By the time I type colon name one, so I could use the print, one thing with Jupyter notebook, you don't always have to use the print, but you could add um, Jupyter, like the last word in that cell can be run. By the time I call name one, it returns it as promise. But for example, let me type name, for example, I don't have anything called name. I've not declared any variable called name. If I run it, it will tell you that name is not defined. So that variable name is not defined. So for you to call anything, it, you've you have to define the variable, declare the variable that this is equal to this. You get, and also it's case sensitive. If, for example, when I type promise, it's um, small data. I can't just call, maybe if I want to call promise, all this comes with small data. Or maybe, for example, I type name one with a small data. I can't come and say, give me name one. Name one is still going to return an error. 
because name one is not defined. It has to be the small letter. I hope, I hope we're following through. So we're talking about variable declaration and also a variable can be overwritten. So for example, I specify my X is equals to five, right? Sorry, X is five. If I come and say X now is equals to um, seven or eight, if I call X again, it will give me eight because it has written, overwritten what I had initially. So know that variables can be overwritten. So try not to overwrite your variable whenever you're doing anything. You get? Okay, so the variables, variable name can have um, contain only a numeric character. So you could, you can have, um, like for example, I can say, I want to write um, something, let's say name. I can't say this, this is wrong. So you, well, you could use underscore in your name. So in your variable declaration, so you could use numbers, you could use letters, but remember numbers can start your variable. You can use underscore, you can use hyphen in your variable name, in, in, when naming your variable. So it has to be letters and numbers, you could use underscore. I hope that's clear. Okay. So I also want to talk about uh, naming multi-word variable. So there are different ways to, for example, I have on to write my name. So it's not more than one word. So there are different ways to name um, multi-word variable. The first one is camel case. So I say, if I say, okay, let me declare my variable. So the camel case, each word in your, each word in the variable you want to declare has to start with capital letter apart from the first one. So if I say, okay, let me, let me change this to a markdown. So let's talk about camel case, camel case. So this is when you are naming your variable, naming variable. So each word, each word in your variable should have, should start with a capital letter apart from the first. For example, I want to say my variable. It could be my variable name. So you see that the first word is a small letter, but apart from that, the other words start with capital letter. Because if my variable equals to whatever you want, you can say seven, let's put it. So this is the camel case. And one thing you should know, you should be consistent. So if I'm going with camel case, I should use camel case um, along the line. So for example, I said my, one way to, sometimes you don't have to type in everything. You no, know, I've specified my variable name is equals to seven. So I can start typing my, then press your tab key. It helps you auto complete it. Variable name. So for example, I have my variable name. I don't have to type everything. Just use your tab. It auto completes it for you. That's fine, yeah? So this is called camel case variable. Okay, I just saw your message now, okay? So you, you when you use your tab, it auto completes it for you, okay? Then the next one we want to talk about is um, Pascal case. So with Pascal case, each word in your variables will start with a capital letter. In this case, we used my with small letter, but with Pascal case, so let me just change this to markdown. So we'll talk about Pascal, Pascal case. So if I want to write my variable name, for example, I will start doing this, my variable name. It's, it's not, sorry, that's this. My variable name equals to, let's say six. You get, so the, the camel case, everything apart from the first letter starts with capital letter, but for Pascal, everything, all the words start with capital letter. So that's for camel case. Then we have snake case. So with snake case, you separate each word in your variable name with an underscore. So if I want to do a snake case, for example, so I just do snake, don't worry. Snake case, it is. Snake case, so we're gonna open it as this. Snake case, so if I want to write my variable name, I do my underscore variable underscore name equals to. So I hope you understand the three different ways you can kind of assign your variable. So it depends on whatever works for you. There's no right or wrong way, but try to be consistent. You can't say I'm writing the code. The first line I'm using camel case. The next line I'm using camel uh, Pascal case, or the next one I'm using snake case. Try to be consistent in your variable declaration. I hope that's clear and we are following. 
So the next thing I want to talk about would be, so let me just give a brief overview that I've done this initially with your Jupyter notebook. So when you come here, you see this button, this button is to save, save whatever you're working with. This is to add a new block of cell in your notebook. Then with this, you cut, so I've added, if I do this, I'm cutting out that cell. Yeah, this would paste back the cell. Okay, this is copy. This is cutting here, this, this copies, for example, I have this cell, I can copy the cell, then I can decide to paste that back. So we have a add new cell, cut cell, copy your cell, paste back. And you can see I can use this to move my cell up or down. So if I'm moving, I'm moving things up, I use this to move things back. Yeah, I can run that cell, use this to run. So it's the same thing you do with your control, enter, or your command, enter. The same thing, you could use it to run, or your shift, enter, then you could use this to stop your code. That you could use to, for example, you want to start everything again, reset your variables. It's called like resetting your sheet. It's called reset, you're starting your kernel. So, by the time if I do this, let's try that for example. So, let me say I want to restart my kernel. Yeah. Restart my kernel. So, every variable I've specified will be lost. So, for example, if I want to run this again, I won't be able to run it again. It will tell me that it's not defined because you're like wiping everything from the memory. You get then with this definitely you can use it to change code or markdown, right? So now let's get a new cell and let's talk about commenting. I know you'd have heard of a lot of um, commenting. What does it mean to comment your code? Commenting. You see that before I write anything, like I change some markdown. So let me put this as um, code. I want to say commenting as a heading, right? If I run this, you see what the problem would be. No name code commenting is defined. That's why I have to change it to markdown so I can call this a heading also. Yeah. So, for example, I want to write, uh, maybe I'm writing something, I, I want to explain what that means, but I don't want the computer to run that. I use the hash key to specify. So, if I, this is a code block, right? By the time I write commenting now, commenting and run it, it doesn't return an error because it's like that hash key just to the computer. Don't run this part for me. This is more like an explanation. So don't commit this to memory. So that's what we call commenting Python. So if, when you see people's code, you see a lot of these hash comments shows that, okay, you could just explain what that cell of code is doing. Okay, are we following through? Somebody said, I can't see the difference in the Camel case and the Pascal case. So with the Camel case, the first word is small later. But with the Pascal case, even the first one is capital letter. So with the Camel case, everything is capital letter apart from the first word. But with the Pascal case, everything, including the first word, starts with a capital letter. Yeah. So I think we're already running behind time. So I'm just kind of speed up from there. So the next thing we're talking about, we'll be talking about data types. What are the data types in Python? So we'll just quickly type in something. We'll say data types, data types. Yeah. So there are different data types in Python. So we we'll start with integers. With integers, we we'll look at um, floats. We we'll look at um, strings. The strings. We we'll look at also bools. Okay, booleans. Let me call them booleans. Also called bools. The markdown is used to kind of specify your headings. So like now this comment shows that this is a new level. So when we started, we talked about terms in the language, we talked about variable. So markdown is like your headings, subheadings, and to so use markdown to um, write maybe explanations of whatever you're doing. So we'll talk about data types, right? So the first data type is integer. So I could say integer, integer. So you notice here I'm using, it's a code block, that's why I'm using the hash key to specify that this is a comment within my code. So integers, you say integers and numbers, and numbers, rather than saying numbers, you could say it, integers are all numbers. So I can say integers and numbers, like whole numbers. So by the time I specify x is equals to five, right? If I print, um, let's say, let's print type. So there are different functions you use in Python to do different things. So print is to kind of print out whatever you have. And type is to show what's the type of data inside that um, variable. I say type, type x. So I've specified that my x is equals to five. 
I want to say, okay, what is the type of my x just to prove you see it as class is an integer. So you know that whenever you hear integers, integers are numbers, whole numbers. So if I say, okay, let me even do on that thing again. Um, let's talk about floats. Floats are decimals. So the same x, I say x equals to 5.0. So indicating your point shows that, tells you that this is a float. So if I say print, let me, let me use y, I'm not going to use x this time. y is equal to this. So I say print type y. So you should also take note of the brackets. So if I'm having like a beginning bracket, it's all, always have to close. Yeah. So if I print type, um, why it shows that this is a float you get. So it changes it like the point specifies that this is a float. So there are different types. So when you're dealing with numbers, you're either working with integers or you're working with floats. Okay. So let me add that. So you could, there's also what we call casting. It's kind of changing what, um, what you have already. So for example, you know that my X is a, my X is a, an integer, right? So I say, okay, floats, Give me the float of x. What, what would you print? It would print it as 5.0. It shows that the float of x is 5.0. So the point, you, you including a point makes it a float. So the next data type, we've talked about integers, we've talked about floats. Let's talk about um, strings. Strings, so the next data type. So we talk about numbers. So when you are introducing letters, it's called string, anything later I want to introduce. So I could say, okay, let's say my name, my name is equals to, I want to put like a letter, I want to put like a word. I can say, like, let's say I put my name equals to promise. This wouldn't work because the computer will be looking at, oh, in this, my, in this um, notebook, what is promise? And there's something called promise. So you have to include either a quotation, so that is a single quotation or a double quotation. So if you look at this quotation, so if I type from, let's, let me try this to show what I'm saying so that you doesn't, so if I type this, for example, it turns an error because promise is not in the base, but you want to tell the computer, okay, this is a new thing I'm introducing, don't call it, you put a quotation. So if I do promise, for example, it shows that until that works, so you could either use a single quote or a double quote. It doesn't matter. It's still string. So if I say print, let's say type, type my name. So remember, I use um, the tab key to, to complete. It completes it. But if I print this, it shows that it's a string. So str is a short form of string. So it shows that this is a string. So I could also say, let's say, let's try another one with um, the with the double quotation. So if I just say name equals to, let me use the double quotation now, promise. Yeah, so if I print type now, it still show that it's a string because name, yeah, it still shows that it's a string because you could use either single or quote, um, double quotation, depends on what works for you. So why a lot of people, uh, it depends on what you want to work. For example, within my string, I want to use the single quotation inside. For example, I want to write, um, let, me, let me put this text equals to, um, sorry, I am. So I want to say I am. So it's already making an error. So if you want to use the single quotation inside, I want to write something like an apostrophe, it's better to use the double quotation so that it's not reading that as the end. Because if you're putting this one inside, we should, the computer will be like, okay, this is the end of, this one, I'll be expecting another end. So that's why you should know the post. If I want to write anything with apostrophe inside, just better to use the single, the double one outside. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So, and there are some functions. Now let's start talking about the functions you could carry out with these different data types. So for, for strings, um, for floats and, uh, let's see, I don't know if you should undo that, that. So we'll talk about the arithmetic operations later on, but for, um, strings, for example, there are some things you could carry out with your string. So there are some functions you could use with your string. Number one is to the length. So if I want to know how long is my name, so how many letters are in my name, you could just come, there's a function in Python called length, L-E-N. So I put L-E-N name, it shows you how many letters do you have in 
that function called name. It shows seven. So the, there is the length function to check. I hope you are following through. So if your double, your string contains double apostrophe, you could use the one outside. So if your it contains double inside, you could use one outside. Yeah, or I think there's also a form, you could also use a three apostrophe also to bound. So it depends on so if you are using if it contains one inside, use to so outside. If you can so just know how to because if you're using the same one as you're using to bound it, it will return an error because that one inside will be seeing it as the end of that one. So it's expecting it to start a new um, cell outside. So we talked about the functions you can use for a string. So we'll call them string functions. So we have the length len function to check the length of your string or um, like how many liters in your string. Yeah. There is also the che to check if something is in something. So you can, I can say promise, um, I can say promise in, so before I even talk about this, the string function, let me talk about booleans. Booleans are true or false values. So I say, uh, let's say y is equals to true. This is a boolean because it returns, uh, if it's true, it's either true or false. So and if you are specifying your true or false, your first one has to be capital letter. So if I print type, type um, y, for example, it returns it as a um, bool, shows that it's a boolean. So we've talked about string, we talked about integers, we talked about floats, we talked about strings, and we talked about bool. So I could also have, um, let's say, another one to turn it. Uh, let's talk about the false. So if I say z is equals to false, so what, what I mean is case sensitive. See, I put my f as small later. This would return an error because the computer does not understand what false is. If you want to pick out the false in the computer, it has to be capital letter. You see, it has turned green. So when you're typing out your code and if you seen it's highlighting it as something, it means that it means something in Python. Like when I print out type, you see type is green. When I would talk about print, it's green. Five. So all these things are, so once you see a good way, one of the best practices, anything that is highlighting as this, don't use it for something. So don't use it to create your variable. So I can't type, I want to say my variable, I want to create a new variable. I can say, I can't say, oh, I should go. I can't say false is equals to. This is a very wrong practice. You get, so this some like, when you see it is highlighting, I mean, it means something in Python and you shouldn't use it. So if I print um, type now, type Z, it shows that my Z is a bool, boolean. I hope that is clear. Yes, you can use triple code. Okay, some of this, yeah, this triple code. Then also talk about, let's check. So we're talking about string methods now. So we want to check if something is inside a string. So remember my name, let's print out my name. My name is equals to promise. For example, I want to check is R in prom in name. So using the in function shows, yeah, it's like asking the computer, is this in, in this variable? What are my print, for example? So I have to specify it as a string. Not, I can't just call it R because the computer does not. So anything that is not um, specified, like in the system, you have to use a string because this is a string, right? So I'll say it's R in name. It returns as true because if you look at promise, there's R. So let's try something now. So let me check. Let me check if P, P is P in name. What do you think this will return? You could just type something. What do you think this will return? Okay, let's. Who else? Do you have any other um, contrary opinion? No, no, because it's a capital letter. Thank you very much. So by the time you return, it turns as false. Yeah, false. Because okay. P is supposed to be so. If I put it as a capital P, you see it as true. So you could also do not in. So it's like the inverse of it. So by the time I do, I, just, I do P. For example, that same thing we did not in name. So there's the in. There is not in, so this will turn true because P is not in name. But if I put something like this, I can return it as false. So the next thing we'll talk about is okay. Let's talk about we could add them um, two strings together. So for example, let's start, let me type something. So my name is Promise, right? So if I put something like surname, surname is equals to my surname is AK. So if I use this AK, right? Um, I remember my name is Promise. So if I want to create, so I created another variable called surname. So if I want to say, okay, full name, full name. So remember, it depends on if your variable declaration depends on what works for you. I Me, mean, I like using snake case, so I always use snake case, right? I can say, um, full name will be name plus AK, not AK, sorry, surname. So you notice that I don't have to put this in in a quotation because. It's something, it means something in Python. So it will just add it. So then I call full name, for example. So if I do this full name, what would this return? Yeah. So it turns promise AK, but there, because there's no space in it. Because 
there's no so if you want to add anything you want to add a space you just come here you put a quotation of add space and add p to it so by the time i run this because this space is not an object or an item in the string you return it to the promise ak so for example if i want to add a string to a string i could just come rather than even putting specifying this whole surname i could just come here and type ak so it's still the same thing but it has to be in string so it still returned the same thing. I hope we are following through. Yeah? Yes, ma. Okay, so another function we can also do with, with um, strings would be, remember name is in, my name is, um, okay, the capital, the first word is in capital. So I could do name dot upper. What do you think this would do? The name will be in capital letters. Yeah, so it takes it to capital letters. So there's something you should also know when you are doing with string. For example, I've said name dot upper is equal to promise. It, it, name is you turns promise. But if I call promise now in my name, what would it return? It still return this as the way it was before. So it's called you have to reassign when you're doing something like you want to change it. You have to reassign it because if you just do this and just pronounce it, it doesn't change what it was initially. So you have to reassign it. So if I don't, I want to make my name upper, I can just name is equal to name dot upper. So whenever I call name again, it returns, it returns this at upper. Do you understand that? And if I do dot lower, you, you already know what that would return. It takes it to the lower case. It takes it to lower case. So we have the dot upper and the dot, dot lower function. Yeah. There's also the dot replace. Let's say if I say name dot replace. So if I want to use the dot replace, I want to change something inside my list. I can say, okay, replace P with, um, what can I replace it with C? That's to be string, for example. If I run this, okay, because there's no, because now my, my name is in cap log. So when it checks it, there's nothing in small letter. That's why it didn't change. But if I change this to capital letter, for example, change P, let's just change P to T. So it has returned, changed that P too. So it's replaced. You get, so these are some of the functions you can carry out with, uh, or the methods you can carry out with strings. There are a lot of other ones because of time, we're not, I can't cover everything. So it's for you to go check it. So you could just write it down. Some other functions you could look at when working with some strings. Look at the, the strip method. There's a strip, there is splits. So in your own leisure time, you could just go through and explore the different um, things you could do with the string. Yeah, so I'll just give you at least the basic ones we need to know.